Good afternoon. I'm Andy Morikawa. I am a fellow at the Virginia Tech Institute for Policy and Governance, and I am a board member for VIA International, which is based here in San Diego, and was a pre-conference program presenter in Chicano Park. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce and uh, welcome Dr. A.T. Ariaratne, uh, leader and spiritual guide of the Sarvodia Shramadana movement uh, to the stage to be our keynote speaker. Dr. Ariaratne is the leader and the spiritual guide of the Sarvodia Shramadana movement, which he founded in 1958. Sarvodia is the largest non-governmental organization uh, in Sri Lanka, serving over 20,000 villages. Uh, during a time of great civil unrest and violence in Sri Lanka, Dr. Ari founded Sarvodia with the goal of bringing people from all ethnic and religious groups to build villages and to live peacefully and safely together. Twenty years ago, I had the good fortune to travel with three friends to Sri Lanka to learn about Sarvodia and to meet Dr. Ari. Shortly after we arrived, we were surprised and delighted to learn that Dr. Ari had invited us for breakfast with him and his wife, Neetha, uh, in their modest home in Moratua. And uh, he asked if we'd like to join him after breakfast for a day of visiting Sarvodia centers and villages. Traveling uh, with Ari was amazing and eye-opening. Uh, to watch him as he plunged in to help working on a road building project, wielding a pickaxe himself. I watched as people came up to him to seek his advice and wise counsel. Uh, he dedicated water systems that saved people countless hours of having to haul water to their homes from distant wells. And occasionally, uh, he would wander off into the fields and into the forest nearby to pluck out interesting plants. Uh, Ari is a gardener, and he loved gardening, he said. He imagined, he said, retiring and just gardening. That was 20 years ago. I think he'll not retire, for he sees so much more that needs to be done. In those rare moments 20 years ago, I came to see uh, and experience a leadership of a new sort for me, a leadership without borders, one without limits, uh, that would receive the Gandhi Peace Prize along with Desmond Tutu, uh, Václav Havel, Nelson Mandela, uh, and would seek the transformation of an entire nation, Sri Lanka, through spiritual awakening, and a leadership that would invite four scraggly travelers into his home for a breakfast of yogurt and porridge. This was a leadership that I would follow and do. It makes sense, for it grows those whom it touches. Dr. Ari brings to us, to this gathering, insights and experiences that grow us as human beings. May today mark another unfolding toward the awakening of us all. We build the road, the road builds us, he says. Be well and happy. It's my great privilege to introduce you to my friend, Dr. A.T. Ariaratne. Thank you, Andy. Good evening, everybody. I'm still jet lagging, so I, if I fall asleep on the stage, please excuse me. 
24 hours of flying is quite <laughs> quite a difficult task. Thank you, Andy, for the excellent introduction you made. I have come here not to, of course, share my experiences, but not to teach you anything. Rather, I would like to learn from your 16 years of great experience in the in building leaders and on leadership. When I recollect what I have been doing without any kind of training or without any kind of leadership training, I was wondering how all these things were achieved. At the very beginning, our, the one who led the meditation, he said, implement from here, but think and feel from here. Now that was the principle which I followed right through. Because I belong to a culture which had about 2,600 years of <clears throat> a certain value system, mainly Buddhist and Hindu. And nonviolence or respect for all life is the central theme of that culture. Unfortunately, <clears throat> people do not live up to those values, particularly because of the materialism we have embraced, which does not know any limits. So greed has taken a very organized form in the world. Greed not only for wealth and power or publicity, but greed along with hatred, when you can't get what you want, then you turn to violence. All this happens because of ignorance. So greed, hatred and ignorance are bad enough, but when they get organized, when they are taught to growing generations, I think we will end up with a world without any living beings on this planet. So what you are doing in conscious leading for global change is something that should spread further and further to every corner of this earth. For 66 years, I have been in it trying to bring about a change, first within myself, then within my family, then within the community in which I lived, then within all the communities in my country, and then whatever possible I could do at the global level to do that too. I did not believe that anybody can transform this world unless you transform yourself. Therefore, with, as a teacher, with my students, I thought I should go to the most backward villages in my country, villages that are economically backward and also socially ostracized. That's how we started this movement called Sarvodaya 56 years ago. In the formal education system, those days, even now, it is not possible to take education out of the classroom. Classroom based, textbook based, examination oriented, that kind of education we are giving children without 
any consideration for the awakening of that total personality. Of course, we do a lot of things for physical well-being, emotional well-being, mental or intellectual well-being. But spiritual well-being is almost completely forgotten. So we thought at that time, that is 56 years ago, we should try to add this component to the educational system. But it could not be done by getting the authorities to agree to that kind of change. So it has to be done in a very indirect way. So during vacations and weekends, we got permission from parents and took these students to rural areas. And the excuse we gave was, we are going to broaden their education by taking them into these rural areas and going to live and share with them. And we told the students, now try to practice four principles in the villages. First one, human beings or animals or the plant kingdom you see, try to extend loving kindness to them. Don't even just cut a branch of a tree unnecessarily. They also have life. So respect for life is the first principle we are going to practice. Second is, this kind of loving kindness is of no use unless we try to help communities to solve one or more of their problems. For example, if they had no drinking water, let us all get together with the village people and dig wells, build them up during these holiday camps. So you, you have loving kindness converted into compassionate action. And that gives you immediate joy because joy of seeing other people happy, having some water, clean water to drink, or irrigation canal or reservoir we build, so that they have the satisfaction of getting their paddy fields, rice fields irrigated. Now that is compassionate action, not development. Because I think the word development started with livestock farming and things like that. Now human beings are also using that word for development, human resources, like any other non-human resource. So we thought that when human beings are directed in this way, the joy they get out of that service is something that lasts forever in their life. But when you do this kind of thing, naturally people, some of them praise this work, some do not do that, they will oppose, obstruct. So we didn't mind that because we wanted to develop a fourth principle of equanimity, accepting loss and gain, name and blame with equal detachment. So the objective that we placed before the students were to practice these four principles. So we dig hundreds of wells, thousands of irrigation canals, thousands of houses, school buildings like that, what started as an educational ex extension experiment ended up with a total integrated community development movement emerging. And we had to give a name. So we borrowed a word that Mahatma Gandhi has coined, Sarvode. 
در رود امین بلف آروبال ایتی وات گاندی سید وی انٹرپریٹیڈ ایتی 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 ایوکننگ آف آل سو وی When we went into villages, we got village communities also to join us. Let us cook in the same kitchen for all outsiders as well as the village people. We took the raw material. Let us get up at 5 in the morning. At 5.30, let's sit down and meditate. Meditation without any religious uh, connotation. It's totally looking at oneself, one's body, and one's mind, and how one could control, one could really understand the body, the emotions, the thinking, and the principles that govern our thinking, or our speech, uh, our talking, or any actions. Because of the light, I find it very difficult to concentrate. Anyway, we made the village community along with us to be like a university. We are from 5 in the morning till 10 in the evening we had a program which included 6 hours of physical work plus 3 or 4 hours of sitting down and learning. A university professor sit down with an illiterate villager and he begins to understand how much he has lost. And the villager begins to understand how much he has lost by way of education. So here is a place where both could meet. So as this movement grew to 100 villagers in 1967, then 1,000 villagers by 77, then almost more than half the communities in the country by 1980s. We had to formulate, I had to give up my job because I had to fully concentrate on this work that is in 1972. Without any other form of income I thought no I must make a sacrifice. Both myself, my wife and the one child I had, we had at that time we decided take the risk. And today, I'm happy to say that in six areas of leadership, we have managed to have certain programs developed which function well. First is the spiritual field. Because the religions are becoming increasingly uh, materialistic. Religions were not emphasizing the spiritual core of religions. So without antagonizing religious uh, leadership, we had to show them that certain principles we have learned in religion could be practiced in what is called development welfare, day-to-day -day activities. Now, for example, while the individual objective was developing loving kindness, compassionate action, altruistic joy and equanimity, when we work as a group, four principles emerged. Sharing, pleasant language, constructive activity and equality in association. All these qualities or principles we learn from the village community because after 450 years of colonial rule, the, those who were modernized, westernized we call, they had forgotten these principles. So, but the village people preserved them for a long time. So our students and we ourselves learn from these people. And we never try to find out to what caste or race or religion or linguistic group the participants belonged. 
We only wanted them to understand that in a particular village community, villagers know about their needs. So, 10 basic human needs we identified by getting 600 people who were not illiterate, at the same time who were not highly literate, to come together. So, these people were made to write down what they believed to be their basic human needs. So, they wrote down environment first. The majority said number one should be environment. Second, clean and adequate su supply of water. Three, a house to live. Then, clean food, health care, toilets and wells and things like that. Energy requirements, education, health, spiritual and cultural needs. And then we got them to divide them into sub-needs. So they divided them into 300 odd sub-needs, I remember. Then I got 100,000 of these little books printed and distributed in Sinhala, Tamil and English in all the villages in the country. So much so, like a this spread to every village, so it was very difficult to share the same discipline we had within the movement. But then we thought the best is now the leadership that the students were learning and practicing at the level of the community should make the community take over leadership. So, in every village, we organized preschool children. I remember there were no nurseries in our country at that time. I myself have gone and opened about 8,000 preschools. We had no money to put up permanent buildings put up sheds or under trees, trained the preschool teachers and got them to do three or four activities pertaining to children. One is good nutrition, health care, then psychosocial development of the child and also to organize mothers groups. So children's groups, mothers groups, students groups, farmers groups, those who are doing various other kinds of crafts and all that, businessmen, he formed different groups and related them to the ten basic needs. When they were functioning well, we got them registered under the government as legal entities. As much as 15,000 villagers we were able to bring under that kind of legal kind of organized form. So, village leadership was developed and in the village executive committee they had to have one child representing the children's interest, two children, two from the youth group, three from the mother's group, like that in a committee of 25, even children were enrolled. And the children were taught that in the constitution, when you attend a meeting, how you should behave. Supposing if you are drunk, you can't come to that meeting. If an adult comes after taking alcohol or drunk, a child gets up and says, uncle, father, you have no right to attend this meeting, you are violating our constitution. So right from the childhood, a seven-year-old child pointing out to this adult, then that adult will never come drunk to a 
village meeting. In that way, I am not going to give. I can give hundreds of examples like that, how the children became instruments for changing the lifestyle and behavior of adults. So, it was a question of giving leadership, not by a particular set of people, but everybody developing those qualities and being able to control one another. Now, when we had this integrated community development programs, we took it through five stages. First, psychosocial development stage. Second, legal, no, secondly, social infrastructure building. Third is legal. Fourth was something to do with savings, credit, and all that kind of thing, economic. Fifth was political, not party and power oriented politics, but real democracy at the grassroots level. Remember, we were doing all this without getting ourselves attached to any political party or political organization. We wanted this to be outside political power game. Similarly, outside any religious or communal thing like that, it was above all these divisions. So, when in our country from time to time, various conflicts occurred, our movement should, could go to those places and bring about reconciliation among people who were in conflict. We had a 30 year war, which was purely political. Various leaders representing various communities, they tried to divide people for the sake of acquiring power, which ultimately led to a very uh, difficult situation in the country where there was the government and uh, they called terrorism, they were fighting. So, Sarvode had to play a role. So, we started with immediate effect from 1983. First, a relief program for those who were affected. We didn't care whether they were Sinhalese, Tamils or Muslims. Second, while giving relief to do whatever rehabilitation we could. Thirdly, reconciliation. Fourthly, uh, what we could do with the help of government and others, reconstruction. Then bring back to the old situation we call reawakening, 5R program. So, during these 30 years, we did this 5R program. And Therefore, when the war finally ended, we were in a situation to get into the field to heal the hearts and minds of people, because a war can end, but it can continue. So, still we are doing it like that. After all these things happened, we thought that from the spiritual side, we were able to get religious leaders of all religions to come together and in every district and every sub-district form groups to maintain peace and also contribute to general development. Then we were able to organize various programs. For example, a lot of drug addiction was taking place in our country. So, to rehabilitate the drug addicts and prevent people from changing, we had a special branch. Like that, there were 15 organizations we created during the last 56 years in various fields. A peace brigade for the peace movement. Then, for the children, another section. 
Like that, there are 15 incorporated bodies with separate membership and executive committees. We are all working together like, say, group of companies. And then after the war, we did two things. That is, we wanted political and economic sector also to be influenced. Because these two are major forces which can bring about peace or which can create conflicts. So with great difficulty, we have managed to organize right across the country in 326 places, that is districts and divisions, groups, every district a council of 100. Their, their idea is not to get into politics, but change the political system. Political system without bringing in any divisive factors and trying to train leaders in real democratic practice at the village level. Representative form of governance in our country has not done well. But that is the form we have. What shall we do? Why don't we try what Mahatma Gandhi, uh, even in America, I, I went once, maybe 15, 20 years ago, when I saw Lincoln's village or something incorporated. When I saw the word incorporated, I thought, why don't we try this? And 3,000 villagers, we got selected who have reached the third or fourth stages. And these villagers were asked to develop a self-governance system. So in the village, a council of 25 people, including women, children, everybody represented, meeting once. They look at the spiritual, moral, cultural, social, economic, and political aspects. Social means human rights, health, education, community leadership, then individual leadership, leadership in different fields, business leadership, like that. And for all this, we had a theoretical base. The roots were in Buddhist philosophy. Buddhism is not a religion as such, not a sectarian thing. It is an explanation of nature within us and outside, and for us to get back to nature. So it's a religion, or though it has become a religion, it's a thinking around which you can get all people together. So we have, in Muslim areas, we have our Muslim leadership in the Hindu areas, Buddhist areas, Christian areas without any religious distinction, we are able to work together. So in that way, we have been trying to promote in Sri Lanka a kind of direct participatory form of politics. Today's pyramidal system, pyramid is like this. Then the executive head and others in many countries, control the whole thing, right down to the bottom. So there's a narrow based triangle here, and the power is only there. But the people are outside, most people. E even if there's a uh, number one expert the, in the world uh, who is not with that political regime, that man will never be used. So that kind of politics. So we wanted to bring this down like this, a very broad-based politics. That is what Mahatma Gandhi called common wealth of village republics. Those are the words he used. So now we are organizing all over the country this kind of, it's very difficult. Their vested interests are not going to just leave you alone. So you have to be fearless. To be fearless, you have to meditate. Meditate means every moment 
whatever comes to your mind, you must be mindful, conscious. Whatever you are going to utter, you have to be conscious of that, mindful of that. Whatever you are going to do, you have to be very mindful. So developing mindfulness is the number one. Any leader who is not mindful, who is not conscious, will do more harm than good. Therefore, we were very, very conscious of the importance of developing right mindfulness. Right mindfulness can take us slowly to right concentration. When you go on a direction of right concentration, traditionally the eight principles we followed, right understanding, right thoughts, right words, right deeds, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Those are called the Noble Eightfold Path. If anybody follows this path in their life, day-to-day -day life, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, such a person is a person who is developing his consciousness. That's why in meditation, it's not something that should be confined to a particular time in the morning and evening. It may be to practice that kind of regular practice is necessary, but in actual fact every moment of our life, we should try to develop mindfulness. And the world needs very much mindful, conscious leaders. Now for all this, we need an organizational, institutional form. So in every district, we have formed leadership training institutes, sometimes very special ones. Then Sarvo, the Institute of Higher Education, like the university. So from all over the world, people come there just to have even a short experience, maybe from two weeks to even a couple of years. So we are happy that a lot of universities in the world and also in Sri Lanka have given recognition to what we have been doing all these years. And now the second and third generations have taken over. I am not involved in anything except any administrative work for money handling or anything. Only if I am called for by the second and third generation for some advice or some celebration, then I go. I avoid as much as possible getting involved in day-to-day -day work because I am now so people call me 84, I call myself 12 years. So finally, what I have to say is, what you are doing is very special. Once before or twice before I have come to the ILA meetings, but today you have expanded so much. Don't stop with it. Now, I too have quite a large number of contacts, so in your networking I will tell them you must network with ILA and I'm sure uh, this movement can contribute so much. Our environment is being totally destroyed. The food we eat in our countries, like here, nobody checks. In most of the poor countries, it's poison that is consumed as food. So in every field, we lead leadership. So now we have formed our economic organization. We are savings, credit. We are not accepting, if we know that this money has come from bribery or killing animals 
or alcohol, we do not accept. Similarly, we do not give credit to anybody who is doing, not doing right livelihood programs. Therefore, thank you very much for everything you are doing and as far as the Sarodaya movement in Sri Lanka is concerned, we will always be with you and I am here because Elisa Sabatani and your chairman and president, they were insisting I should come and I just couldn't say no, so I have come and uh, all I can t tell you is that don't wait till our governments, with all respect to governments, or United Nations, or other bodies, to do this work. We have to do it. We ourselves, the ordinary people in the world, have to build leaders. But one thing you are not doing, I know. What is that? Start building leaders while they are still in the mother's womb. What do I mean by that? In Sri Lanka, in Sarodaya, we have organized programs of pregnant mothers. These mothers and their children uh, and their husbands or spouses, they are trained. They are trained to train the child while the child is in the mother's womb. So there is a gynecologist or uh, uh, physician, uh, musician, uh, meditator, all those people training them. Sometimes when we go to north, poorest areas, I have been to one where 1,500, that is 750 couples have come with their pregnant wives. Teach them what to talk, what not to talk, what not to eat. Because right from the from con conception of a child in the mother's womb, the human personality grows and grows. Then the preschool stage is very important. So for all those, we have developed programs. About 140 programs we have developed. So I think you should also try to introduce a program, not only the, we are physicians and others, but really those who are good meditational practitioners, we should get right from that age till death. Even at our age, now I spend maybe most of my time in looking within myself while the others are encouraged to continue the work we have started. So thank you very much. I wish you all the best. During the question and answer time, I will. Yeah. Oh, this light, you know, I can't see to the light. There we go. Could we? No, no, it's okay now. It's okay now? <laughs> okay. We're going to take some questions. From the floor, we have folks who've got uh, mics, and if you'll just raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. Anybody have questions for Dr. Ari? No question. Any questions for Dr. Ariratne? How many minutes do you have? Hi, thank you so much for speaking. My name is Neela Rajendra, and my family is actually from Sri Lanka, so it's been an honor um, to hear you speak this afternoon. Uh, my question is regarding um, the civil war in Sri Lanka and how your work um, helped bring about peace, if at all, and if you could talk about a little bit more about um, the ethnic conflict and um, 
how your organization um, played a role in that. The, this conflict, before the conflict, 1960, before you were born, I took 1,500 people from the south, booked a train to Jaffna, and there 3,000 people joined us. For one week, we lived together and pleaded with people while we constructed an 18 mile road called Nehru Eli Kaithadi Road, that main road was done by us first. He said, let us not allow this to get degenerated into violence. But the politicians were more powerful than we were, so they created this. So when really it started, there was no way we could do anything. Only thing we could do was to take a risk and go and do that five-hour program. Uh, relief, rehabilitation, reconciliation, reconstruction and reawakening, which we did till the end of the war. After the war ended, the government took over the entire rehabilitation thing. So we don't get mixed up with government though we don't fight governments also. They generally attack us, but we don't attack them, because we don't want to remove the outside. We want to heal from inside. So every month, about 300 young people and families also are exchanged between North and South. Silently, we are continuing with that. And in all the eight districts in the north where the war took place, I think we may be doing most of the work for rehabilitation and reconstruction. <laughs> Other questions for Dr. Ari? How many minutes are left? Can we lead them to meditate? Can I lead them to meditate for five minutes? <laughs> okay. As the speech seems to be unquestionable, that means you have not listened properly. So, we will have three minutes of meditation. Don't lean against your chair. Put your feet firmly on the ground. Don't lean against the chair. Put your right hand on your left hand. That is the best way to get the nervous system working. Close your eyes very lightly. Look at your own body from head to foot. Extend loving kindness to your own body. This body of mind which is a combination or coming together of solidity, liquidity, air and heat, should be healthy. I should be physically healthy. I should be physically healthy. My mind is created by various sensations I get through my eyes, my ears, my nose, my tongue, my body and the mind itself. May my mind also be healthy. May I not get any feelings of ill will or anger or greed. May I be well in my mind. May there be peace in my mind. May all of us in this hall be healthy in body and mind. May all of us in this hall 
be healthy in body and mind. May all the people in this city, may all the people in this world, may all the living beings in this world be well and happy. May I have peace in my mind, may I have peace in my family, may I have peace in the place where I work or I study, may there be peace in my country, may there be peace in the world. Thank you very much. On behalf of the ILA board and staff, I'd like to thank Dr. Ari for his very generous uh, contribution tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Ari.